Welcome to Law and Justice. I'm Jane Walcahy. Today I am joined by Trina O'Connor, a criminologist who is also a pal of mine, uh, at least virtually anyway, and I'm a great admirer of Trina's work. Um, and we're going to be talking about relationships and why they matter, because this is the series Relationships Matter. Uh, thanks, Trina. How are you? I'm really good, Jane. Thanks ever so much for asking me to come along. It's, it's gorgeous to chat to you, as always. Thanks, Trina. So um, maybe you can just tell me a little bit about yourself, Trina, and your background to kick off, please. Right. So I come from Dublin, if you can tell by the accent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a north side dog. So um, I grew up on the north side of Dublin um, and I had three siblings, three sisters. And uh, my mum and dad uh, are from north side Dublin as well. So mum's from the inner city of Dublin and, and dad's family originally are from Ballyfermot and then moved to Artain. So I come from big families. So dad had a family of 15. Wow. And, yeah. And mom had a family of 10. So I have a lot of aunts and uncles and uh, I think I've got about 100 cousins. Oh, so, my goodness. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I come up from, you know, that kind of family, big families, family influence. But my mom and dad really came from um, poverty because they grew up in an island where there wasn't much opportunity for working class people. So um you know, my, my dad was a bricklayer, so work would have been very transient depending on the cycle of recession because tradesmen always lose their gig when there's a recession and then when there's a boom, there's loads of work. So uh, dad sadly passed away in at Christmas in 2019. He was only 70, so uh, that was a, a big loss for us. But um, my parents were very young when they had my sisters and I, so they were in their early 20s. Mom was like, I think 23 and she had four babies very very yeah. young and um they didn't have any financial resources they didn't really have any social capital either so they ended up homeless with their children okay. and at one stage we were homeless in Kabarik um in a tent and the lovely neighbors oh, wow. yeah in in the, in the tent of a house so mom and dad had squatted in a house they'd squatted in Ballymun and then they squatted in, in Kabarik and um the corporation at the time said that they would get them a property but my dad didn't really trust your man so he said well I'll give you yeah I'll give you the property back but we're not moving out we're moving into a, a tent in the garden so um at night mom and dad would stay in the tent and the lovely neighbors next door the peppers would take us girls in now I don't remember that Jane um, you were very small I was very young and and as far as I understand it was for a very short period of time and out of that we were then moved to Darndale okay. but mom couldn't settle in Darndale she didn't really Really, the um the area didn't really suit her. She was from the inner city, as I said, and then they'd been moved to Dunny Kearney, so she wanted closer. So dad ended up doing a deal with a family in Artane where we gave them a few bob and they transferred because people used to do this transfer. Okay, yeah. So they transferred to a house in Artane where my mom still lives, and I actually live in the garden where I built a small house. So this is my little house. Um very, very tinchy, but it's grand. And uh, my parents, my parents were together for 30 years. They were married for 25 years, but there was a lot of stress in their marriage. Um, poverty and um, money really paid a, a big kind of, had a big influence on their, their relationship. So their relationship suffered at, at times. And because they were very young as well, um, and because they came from backgrounds where there was aces in their background, so there was a lot of kind of struggling going on there for them. And they eventually divorced, actually. And my dad remarried. And um, I have two baby sisters. One is 20 and one is 16. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's lovely. And so I have two mammies now. So my mom and my stepmother are really good friends, actually. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, very supportive of each other. So, um, yeah, so I grew up on the north side of Dublin. And in our town, when I was a young person, there was a lot of addiction in this area. There would have been a lot of um, joyriding going on. And okay. um, a lot of people left school very young, as, as did my dad. My dad didn't have a secondary education at all. So um, it was kind of that cycle that I grew up in. And I was asked once, why um, did you not get involved in criminality or why did you not get involved in addiction? And, and I actually put it down to, you know, the people that were around mm -hmm. So while my parents had difficulties in their marriage and all that, and while they had, you know, problems with financial resources, I was rich. Mm -hmm. 
because right. I had people around me who cared about me, even though they had issues. I still very much was loved. My mom and dad were very much about telling you that they loved you, being concerned about who you were spending time with, wanted to know who our friends were. Nice. Everybody loved our house because we were allowed to bring our friends in. And my mom and dad were so young that they they were very on trend. Like even, even <laughs> yeah, like even a couple of days before dad died in the hospital, um, one, one of the care workers came in and she had a Billie Eilish t-shirt on. And my dad went, oh, Billie Eilish, yeah, I love her. And the carer couldn't believe this. Very young yes. And she was like, really? And I was like, oh yeah, I kind of know her. And he'd go, I don't, <laughs> don't mind that L when she's not down with the kids at all, you know? <laughs> Um, so they were very young and then also one of the things I think that really helped me as a young person growing up in our town was St Paul's Youth Club now this was where relationships were formed this was where support came from my peers and from role models youth workers mm -hmm. and for me being part of St Paul's Youth Club was phenomenal and there's something about our town people now of course I'm biased and I'm going to <laughs> that's okay but, but there is something about our time people. And when you meet our time people, you know that you've met an our time person because what, what we were brought up with, what was instilled in us was help people whenever you can. Okay. And the U Club was very much about that. And my friend lives in Cavan now, and she told me a wonderful story the other day about somebody that she met, Martin. She works in Tesco's, and this man came in, and she was talking about having a, a, a nest, a, a, a wasps nest in our garden and whatever and he came back in a few days later with some solutions for her uh, and he's just a customer and he up to get talking and it turns Lovely. out he lived a road parallel to where she lived in our town and he went you see that's the thing about our town people we just help each other out don't we yeah. and the U club it's still that look I'm sure lots of other communities are like that as well of course they are but the U club was very much about supporting your um, peers so if if there was somebody struggling in the youth club one of the things that the youth workers would encourage would you to be a buddy to that person and it was very organic Jay mm. and there was no there was no kind of theory around it it was just sure. a natural thing we didn't understand the importance of these kind of practices of supporting each other peer-led support and that kind of stuff so um yeah, for me growing up, that was kind of what I grew up. And then my parents eventually opened a shop towards the later end of the of their marriage. And that was very much a community shop because they would have helped people out that would have been struggling financially. So they would have given them credit to buy their groceries and, and then taken butter vouchers to pay for the groceries. Okay. You know, that kind of thing. So uh, that's my background on a personal level. Yeah. And so from, from the sound of it, you obviously describe the great support and the, not only the declarations of love, but that feeling of love and nurture that unfortunately not all kids have. Yeah. And not all, I don't think all communities either really have that strong fabric that you describe there in our team, despite some of the challenges, which we might discuss a bit later. But then can you tell me, how did you move into becoming a criminologist did that happen early in your life or was that a, a thing that is is a newer development Trina yeah so even as a teenager I was interested in what made people um commit criminal acts and I knew young people who were involved in criminality and I remember even as a 15 and 16 year old saying but why are you shoplifting why are you doing that you're taking somebody else's stuff and I remember talking to uh, a guy who sadly has ended up in prison who and he said to me because I can mm -hmm. and and because I've no other way of getting that aftershave or I've no other way of getting that tracksuit or them pair of trainers so for me that really kind of piqued my interest and in the youth club that I spoke about earlier I remember when I was 16 they brought a guy in and he was actually from Ballymun and he gave us a talk on addiction and it was heroin at the time and he spoke to us about what heroin had stolen from him and he very, very, you know, descriptively described kind of, you know, very visually how heroin brought him down the road to criminality and how it stole his family from him, how it stole his future from him, um, how it stole his dignity, his standing in the community, his 
association with civil society, all of them things. And it really, really impacted me. And he spoke about how he recovered and how he was in recovery and what were the things that made him recover. And that's when I went, I want to do that. I want to help people because it was so simple. All people need is a little bit of support and, you know, uh, scaffolding around them. So that piqued my interest in addiction, also criminality and in social kind of um kind of issues that we faced and um, so that that kind of made me decide well where where did I want to work so did I want to go corporate did I want to go retail and I decided that I wanted to work in charities and voluntary sector so I I did a little bit of work in the UK in the fraud squad for the DSS actually right I, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was one of the things that I did uh, when I was very young. Uh, I was about 18 and the fraud squad over there used to bring me with them on. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, on, on, the, on the kind of stakeouts. The DSS <laughs> was the Department of Social Protection. So it was like the CSA had just been set up, the Child Support Agency. So I used to go on stakes, stakeouts with them. They used to bring me because I was great crack. Jane. Yeah. Was of my I can opinion. imagine, yeah. I was only 18. I was absolutely bonkity bonk. I would yeah. do anything, you know, and they used to bring me. So I worked in the admin pool of the child support agency when I lived in London. And um the 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 fraud squad just one day, someone one of them came in, looked for something, ended up talking to me and said, We need her with us on stakeout. She's brilliant. Yeah, it was your and your I, your glittering kind of personality <laughs> and the, the relationship they wanted with you. I mean, yeah, and, and I was brilliant at um, kind of picking up um, if something was different. So I would be able to, like, do, we do have a cultural differences, uh, cultural blindness sometimes with people of colour. So mm -hmm. because we are white and a lot of the fraud squad, squad were white, but I was very good at picking up on little things. Um, and they, they spotted that. So um, I did that for a little while and then I came back to Ireland to live. And I ended up working with St. Vincent de Paul okay. and working in St. Vincent de Paul really, I suppose, embedded in me the difficulties that poverty can cause for people. And it made me really want to support people out of poverty. Um, and one of the ways that I saw people could move out of poverty was through education. Mm -hmm. So. I, I thought to myself, I have to get an education. So I had a leave and cert. I had a post leaving uh, certificate kind of diploma, but I didn't have a university qualification because when I grew up, Northside Dubliners didn't go to university. Like when I was doing, when I was doing the post leave and cert, they just called me Northside for about, you know, 18 months when I was there. And then eventually people got to know me. There was another girl from Ballymun. They just called her Ballymun. And they Lovely. Just, yeah, nice. They just go, here's Ballymun and Northside. And we go, yeah, all right. What's up? Didn't take any uh, yeah. issue with it at all. And actually, a lot of them people that I did that qualification were are still friends of mine to this day. Mm -hmm. You know, That's um, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just banter, you know. But yeah. for some people, that can be very damaging. And we have to recognize that. Yeah. Be very damaging. Well, there can be an imposter syndrome anyway that any of us can have if we're in the slightest bit different yeah. to the majority. You know, yeah. whether that's our skin color, our gender orientation, our religious beliefs, social or whatever, class. social class for sure yeah. at universities. I definitely suffered from imposter syndrome and I probably to this day still do, you know. Um, so, yeah, so I decided I'd get an education and I realized that I needed like a basic uh, kind of grade. So because there was no Susie grants or any grants like that available I worked full-time and went to college so I went to college for over 20 years still going really you know I'm teaching in universities at the minute I did a, a post uh, graduate certificate in law just in the in the last semester you know oh, very just, good yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah really interesting Jane in minute and they've got it up again it's a it's only one semester it's really good if you're interested um so, yeah, so I went back, I, I started doing certificates. So I did stuff in community development. I did stuff in community management, uh, communications. Uh, what else did I do? I did loads of certificates. Then I felt brave enough to go for diplomas, you know. Right. Um, I already had a post leave and cert diploma, but I hadn't got a university diploma. So I get you. again, did diplomas. And then eventually I did um, an undergraduate um, honours degree in psychology and psychotherapy. Loved Fascinating. it. Fascinating. 
Fabulous. And I've been teaching social psychology to young people in DCU, the Centre for Talented Youth. It's fantastic. I tell you, we've got some talented people in this country. And um, so I did that. And then I did the next year after that, I decided I do two diplomas in the one year for the crack. For the so, crack. Yeah. So I did cognitive behaviour therapy diploma and I did the psychology of criminal behaviour. Okay. Now, I always wanted to be a criminologist right back from my teens. So I just wanted to see after doing the psychology and this is the imposter syndrome. Did I have the capacity? Did I have the, the sure. wherewithal? So that's why I did the diploma. Loved it. So then I did a master's degree in criminology in what was known as DIT at the time. Mm -hmm. Brilliant lecturers there. And then I, I was I was working in the area the whole time. So I worked in Dublin Simon, worked in the NEIC, worked with young people. And then um, in 2019, I decided I'd do another master's degree because so many different things have changed in criminology. So I did a, a master's degree in Minute uh, in criminal justice systems and comparative criminology. So looking at systems um, around the world. And that was just fantastic. I mean, Minute, all the places that I've been have been brilliant to study. So that's how I ended up a criminologist. But okay. I worked as a practitioner during them years as well. Yeah, and just on that, what do you mean by criminologist yourself? Because in some ways, it, to me, it's more of an academic thing. You yeah. know, looking at crime and crime trends and punishment and how we respond and how do we try and intervene with with people with offending behavior. But you throughout your career have had very much a practical focus. Yes. So do you kind of combine the two in 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 your way of working and thinking or <laughs> Yeah, what, what that's exactly what I do. So I apply the knowledge that I have. So, for example, I was working for Dublin City Council as a criminologist there for about 12 months. And um, it was a huge job. There was supposed to be a team because it ended up just me. But anyway, we got some stuff done. Um, one of the things that we did was I looked at Ballymun and from going out into the community doing research, we found um, and, and I was working with the team of Dublin City Council Public Realm. They were brilliant, uh, so supportive of my work, you know, and one of the things that kind of kept coming up was the elders in the community felt unsafe. And I kind of identified that they felt unsafe because of the youngsters in the community. And then I'm speaking to the youngsters and the youngsters are bang on. They're yeah. lovely. You know, the elders are great. Yeah. What's going on here? So what I, I started doing a bit of research and I found a project that was done. I'm, I'm, I want to say Chicago. I think it's in Chicago. And it was the Connectedness Project. Okay. So what I did was I, did, I looked at what they did over there. I actually spent some time talking to the lady who was running the project. People are so helpful when you reach out to them. And I took their methods and brought it back here. And I designed a program called No Age Gap. And basically, we based it around a art exhibition. So working with you each in Ballymun, they do a brilliant um, kind of module around framing of pictures and all that. So the young people there uh, are learning how to frame pictures and all that. So then I spent some time talking to the artists in Dublin City Council, kind of feeling out information with them about how to do a, a, an art exhibition. Amazing. Um, yeah, I designed this program. So it was a six week program and it was about a transfer of learning between elders and youngsters and youngsters and elders. So it included we did we did an afternoon tea in the mansion house. The Lord Mayor at the time was Paul McAuliffe, who's from Ballymun. So I press ganged him at an event to give me the mansion house. I uh, didn't give him much choice. Didn't have to force him. He was very yeah. happy to do it. So we had afternoon tea there, but we started off with a world cafe. So I did a world cafe where I asked questions. What's a safe community? What's a safe community to you? And the difference between elders and youngsters was stark. So that gave me a lot of data then to work from. Mm -hmm. um, and then we did a, a session where the youngsters taught the elders how to make the frames, where they discussed what was going to go on the frames. The frames were going to be pictures from their heritage in Ballymun. Then we did a coddle off. So where the elders taught the youngsters how to make a coddle because they had a catering module within you. Okay. Well, so I worked with the chef there. We did a coddle off. There was a big test of the coddles to see who yes. was the best one. Very so cool. So this was all about creating relationships between the elders and, elders and youngsters, because we know that when we eat together, we create relationships yeah. using the applied psychology of, you know, social learning theory, all that kind of stuff. And um, then we did the building of the of the 
the exhibition. Then we had a huge launch. It was around Christmas. We had like a Christmas dinner. It, there was so much in that. But that's how I would practically apply my knowledge from a psychology point of view, from a criminology point of view. Now, the youngsters that were in Ballymun, by the way, weren't a gang of criminals. They were yeah. just young people that I was using as example. Um, and then what it means is when them elders go down to the shops and they see a gang of youngsters, they go, oh, they're not afraid of them because I, know. Yeah. I think sometimes there's this moral panic around youngsters hanging around shops. I hung around shops. Didn't mean I was going to attack anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that we're seeing a rise in antisocial behaviour. Um, but there is a bit of a moral panic around young people at the moment, I feel, mm -hmm. uh, at times. Yeah. So that's that's I hope that answers your question. So that's how I use um, my skills as a practitioner within the community, as a community criminologist. Yeah, fabulous. And so, um, Trina, I've read some of your recent interviews and I heard you on the radio and things. And um, I'm aware that you are interested in the adverse childhood experiences framework. Can you tell me when did you first hear about it and what kind of impact did the findings have on you? Yeah, I think it was around the early to mid kind of 20s, uh, 2205, something like that. It was when, uh, you know, it might have even been earlier because it was when I was in Dublin, Simon. And one of the things that I noticed when I walked to Dublin, Simon was homelessness was very different then, by the way. It was um, people that were homeless came from different kind of you know, the, the, the genesis of the homeless, homelessness was different. And what I noticed was there was a lot of people within the homeless services that I walked in that came from industrial schools, okay. uh, Magdalen laundries, institutions kind of, you know, um, that may, may have been in care as a younger person and aged out into homelessness. Um, definitely people coming with trauma. So I started doing some research and I, I fell across this research and I don't know if it's the original research, but it's a long time now since I've read it, but it was around, I think there was a psychiatrist doing something around uh, weight problems. And he found that there was something about trauma that was causing weight problems in people. So I read lots of stuff. And then over the years, ACEs has become much more kind of, it's much more part of the side guys. Everybody's kind of talking about it. And I follow a lot of people, you know, on different social media platforms. And when I was in the NEIC, the Kin and Hutch feud was going on while I was walking there. And we got some really uh, useful information around ACEs and how people respond to trauma. And there was a brilliant cartoon. Now, that would have been around 2013, 2014, I think, maybe even 2015. But certainly since around the early 2000s, I became aware of it. And it's it's something that I kind of knew. And I think yeah. anybody who works in theologies knows yeah. that if somebody is triggered by something, if their response to something is... Um, what we would consider, you know, not a normal response, then it's a trauma response. Yeah. I just didn't know the language around it. So um, I think it's important that we know it. And, and, and I said it once, somebody said to me, like, you know, when, when you ask people, you know, about their backstory, and I say to them, well, if somebody is giving you a trauma response, then you ask them, tell, tell, tell me about your childhood, you better be prepared for a story because, they're not going to tell you about a gradual growing up from childhood to adulthood. They're going to tell you about trauma and possibly trauma after trauma mm -hmm. that stunted their childhood, that made them create a protection around themselves, that gave them split thinking. So for me, ACEs is something that we definitely need. And I am working on a piece of research at the moment. Can't talk about it really. Jane, okay. you know about it. Um, we're, we're all working on it in the background. So um, ACEs is something that we definitely need to be looking into more for that cohort of people so that we can support them by resolving that trauma mm. and that social construction and uh, policies and decisions, in my view, have created that has caused some of this trauma for some of our most vulnerable people. And I suppose our traditional responses are blaming and shaming, really, aren't they? Particularly when you think about the more of these childhood adversities that people accumulate, um, the, the, the greater the likelihood that they'll have health problems, yeah. uh, behavioural problems, relationship problems and the like, and that they might use drugs and alcohol to survive or they might develop mental health symptoms. And our systems still are a little bit trauma blind, aren't they, Trina? 
Yeah, yeah, I, I told, I mean, I think that's a very good, you know, way of describing it. Some, they are trauma blind. Some people may be aware of it, but, but people are not. We don't have trauma informed practices in most of our um, structures. So you can understand why people lose um, kind of faith in some of our social structures that are set up to, to provide support. Because <clears throat> if you're traumatized by an event and then you, produce a, a trauma response to being asked to do something. So for example, if um, somebody in authority says to a young person, get off that wall, and that young person, you know, Fs them up a, a, an apple tree, right? Yeah. And then the person that's in authority, the security guard or whatever, runs at that young person in a violent way or raises their voice in a violent way or calls the cops and, and traumatizes that young person further, mm you know what are we doing mm. so if a young person is responding there's a couple of things they could be very disrespectful or it could be a trauma response mm. to somebody in authority so that's why we need to make sure that all agencies of the state all support agencies are trauma informed and and practice you know um be, being in a caring way like what about this jane what about if we treat everybody with kindness what might the difference be? What, what is it? Be? Like, what about if we just say every interaction we're going to have with a person, first interaction is going to be kindness. And I try and practice that. And it's amazing the response that has. Because I've made mistakes in the past. I've used my voice. I've raised my voice. I've used my authority. Mm -hmm. I've used my education by using words I know people don't understand. Yeah, sure. All of that. And I've learned that actually... Uh, kindness is very very difficult for people to um, respond to negatively they might not trust you they go why is she being kind what's she after and all that but once you build a relationship with a young person and keep that steadiness of kindness it's amazing what you can achieve yeah no I agree because since learning about ACEs and trauma myself and the importance of kindness and compassion I've had many lovely encounters with people that I otherwise wouldn't have had because I wouldn't have given the time or I wouldn't yeah. have been as conscious about my own energy. And like you say, we can all still make mistakes even with the knowledge or we can get stressed and reactive. Yeah. But at least if we know that if we elicit a negative response from someone, it might well have nothing really to do with us. It might be something from the past okay. or we might be re-traumatizing them somehow by yeah. Uh, using hostile language or being unduly authoritative um, and it it just helps the knowledge does help a little bit um, yeah. but it, but it, it doesn't mean that we will be saints forevermore either um, because we're human and if we don't feel safe and regulated then all bets are off kind of thing and why should we expect teenagers and young children to be able to moderate their behavior in ways that we can't as adults ourselves kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but Trina, would you like to see a focus as well on um, preventing ACEs as well then as the kind of um, emphasis on healing when people have been traumatized in, the, in their childhood or, or adulthood as well? Yeah, and I think, um, I think there are ways of doing that. So we can look at restorative communities. So I know in the National College of Ireland, in the inner city of Dublin, in the financial services there, they've got a restorative uh, education group there. Um, oh, what's it called? A restorative Childhood Initiative, I think it's called. Okay. And it's phenomenal. Um, and they do work with all of the parents and the children. So what they do is they teach the, the parents restorative language and, and, you know, trauma informed practices. And they also teach the children. So if the parent is kind of being triggered and losing their mind, the young person will have the language to be able to say, ma'am, maybe we can talk about it this way. So it's all about creating that relationship within a family. And yeah. that's about supporting and educating and nurturing and growing. And there's another brilliant project in the Northside Partnership called Preparing for Life. Yeah. And they, yeah, I mean, it's phenomenal. And the Atlantic Philanthropies actually originally uh, funded them. I worked for the Northside Partnership when that got funding, brilliant piece of work. Um, so it's been going on now for, I think, 15, 16 years, maybe longer. 
Um, and they work with people when they get pregnant and they support them through pregnancy, they support them through early infancy and on. And mm -hmm. these are the preventative kind of pieces of work that I think are very important in our society. Um, they're tough, they're hard. They take a lot of time. They take a lot of energy. They take funding, not a huge amount of funding. You just need to guarantee the funding to get the right people. Um, so preventative work for me is the key. And if we, as a society, dedicate ourselves to 10, 20 years to providing preventative measures in all of the hotspots that we find where there's trauma, we can, we can work ourselves out of one of the most traumatized nations in the world to not being that way. Mm -hmm. You know, it just takes a commitment. But the way government goes, the way ideologies goes, tough on crime, throw them away, scumbags, all this kind of nonsense that you hear, this populist nonsense, um, that, that influences how resources work. So if we really want to commit, I think we need to be looking at what Scotland have done, investing in a decades long uh, funding process, violence reduction unit, all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, I definitely think early intervention. It, actually, the World Health Organization spoke about this, Jane, and they said that if you invest one euro into early intervention, you save the exchequer four euro in post um, intervention. So even economically, it makes sense. Yeah. But it's just about the leadership of the country and the populist nonsense yeah. that you sometimes hear. Uh, I just yeah. wish working class people would vote en masse. Um, I know. If they don't vote, then we continue to get people that may be a little bit disconnected to communities and think that sometimes when we're telling them stuff has happened that we might be exaggerating. Mm. Do you think as well that uh, some of the problem with failure maybe to really invest in prevention and early intervention is that we, we haven't, and this is not just an Irish problem, I think it's global, oh. we haven't really valued women and children. You know, we talk about it, particularly we talk about valuing children around repeal and the, the you know, the sanctity of life. But if we really thought it was all that um, uh, special, we would support uh, babies and moms and, uh, and children and dads too, whole families, um, in order that they're not highly stressed. Yeah. So that they have enough money, that they have enough food, that they have stable housing. Um, and, and that they feel safe enough to learn and grow and relate uh, in kind ways to one another. Um, do, you, do you think there's an element of that, Trina, that we, we pay lip service to valuing childhood um, and, and maybe sometimes to valuing women, but we don't really? Yeah, I, I, I think... I think we're very much improved with the introduction of the, the Children's Act in 2001, I think it was. I mean, giving children the rights and voices, I think was a huge step forward for Ireland, considering that maybe 40 or 50 years previous, they could be put in an industrial school for robbing a box of matches. So I think that we've, we have moved forward in so many ways in, in huge leaps, mm. but the bounds are not coming. So for me, the bounds are proper representation for women in, mm. in power. And I think the pandemic really showed to me how women are not at the top table when decisions are being made. We still see what's going on in maternity hospitals, some maternity hospitals, um, and that speaks to not um, valuing women's voices and opinions when I would see press conferences going on and no women mm. I mean to say I was aggravated is an understatement I mean I was fuming because women's voices need to be heard we're half I think we're even more of half the population I think we're 52 percent the population in Ireland something like that um, but I, then I hear only the other day women in political positions being sent horrible messages to their homes people turn up their homes so we do have a patriarchal society still there is some misogyny there it's global mm. look at what's happening in afghanistan i sure. mean my, my heart weeps so yeah the struggle is definitely there for women um but it won't stop women like me and you jane you no. know and i think that when you're passionate about something and when you can stand over how you feel about something or when you're coming from an evidence-based you know position it's very difficult to silence mm -hmm. but there is that glass ceiling that it is difficult to uh, push through mm -hmm. and i do know from my own perspective i've been at meetings of maybe 10 15 people and i'm the only woman and mm -hmm. um, even now yeah and, yeah and how does 
how does that feel then when you are the only woman? It, it, do you feel safe and comfortable and valued and that they're eager to hear what you have to say? Or does it kind of vary? It can vary, but for the most part, I'll say, yeah, they are interested in what I have to say. Good. But, but it's taken me years to get to that position. It's taken me years. Like the things I'm saying to you now about social construction, our communities, I'll, I've been saying that for 15 years, but it took me getting qualifications yeah. for people to listen to me. So, and it, and it took me um, having the level of qualification that I have. Now, the fact that I don't have a PhD sometimes can go against me. Um, in that people would say, you know, you, you, you're not a doctor. That still can, sometimes can would happen. Would people you know? say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, people would say that, you know, you haven't Goodness. got a doctor. And, you know, and I go, yeah, okay, I haven't. But, you know, I've got 30 years of experience working in the community. So, you know, because I'm, I'm like in my late 40s, mm. hurtling towards 50. Um, <laughs> that'd be a great party. Fingers crossed, social Fingers crossed. Over. <laughs> You know, uh, so we can have a proper hoolie. So, so that used to really affect me. But I'm I'm very confident with my level of academic achievement now, mm -hmm. um, because I'm very well qualified to speak to my subject. I feel. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and you mean, have. Did you find that sometimes it's important to have the lingo? You know, to be able to talk to the power brokers and the people with the purse strings in a language um that maybe that you understand better than they do frankly but that has some of the jargon in it in order to maybe create a bit of distance almost so that obviously you grew up in certain types of communities and worked in certain types of communities with poverty and addiction but the academic language helps maybe yeah cr just shove in that little bit of distance so that it's more objective almost or that the stats tell us this and these authors, this type of literature, um, this research tells yeah. us that X is the case. Yeah, and Jane, that, that is the key. So if you don't have the jargon, if you don't have, like, that's what I'm saying, I'm speaking to that point, if you don't have the academic achievement mm. that like you and I have, sometimes your voice is not heard. Mm. And, and, and that's wrong because mm. lived experiences is what we need to be listening to. And yeah. I'm organizing a webinar at the moment between the UK and Ireland. I think I sent it on to you. Did and you? Yeah, I have a couple of people coming on to give a lived experience. And I have a man from Wales coming on to give a lived experience. I think he was 13. He'd been stabbed 13 times. He went on to play for Wales and the Jamaican Sevens in rugby. He was in a trap house when he was 13, cutting and moving drugs around. And this is a really interesting story because it speaks to relationships and how important they are. A couple of police that had to keep picking him up realised that every time they tried to pick him up, he was so quick, he was so fast, he kept getting away from them. <laughs> Yeah, he was brilliant. And they said to him, you're such a talent athletically mm -hmm. that they worked with him and got him involved in rugby and then reached out to his grandfather because unfortunately his mother was in addiction. She wasn't able to care for him or support him. So they reached out to his grandfather. His grandfather then took over the caregiving and brought him to rugby and that kind of thing. And he ended up playing for the Welsh team. This kid was written off at 13. Mm -hmm. He was in a trap house. He was under the... Um, the coercion of, of a, an organized criminal gang. He was getting stabbed. He was involved in recruiting other youngsters. Like that relation, that one good adult, well, there was two of them, two police officers, saved his life and changed the trajectory of his life. He's now, working, yeah, he's now working in social services, giving back. He's a married man. He has a couple of kids. Sorry about that. No worries. Sorry, Jane. That's my mother. Oh, right. Do you want, do you want to uh, let her in? Pause. Just pause it for a yeah, second. one sec. Um, Ma'am, I'm in the middle of an interview. So um, that story is, is, is um, remarkable and inspiring. And there are lots of them, actually, you know, but it also speaks to trauma and childhood adversity and poverty and how all these things can come together. In your work in communities, have you seen um, the impact of ACEs very visibly? Like even in our team, do you think there was a high level of, of, of trauma within the community there um, and in Ballymun and, and, and other spots? I mean, in, in a way, trauma is everywhere. It's not yeah. just concentrated in 
certain communities but when it collides with poverty there tends to be a bit more of it I think yeah yeah and and actually everybody will have trauma in their lives but it's when you score high on the scale so when you have maybe four plus and couple that with maybe uh, your own addiction or addiction because I think you know poverty and addiction and trauma all are like the the triangle Mm -hmm. and when you put them together then the outcomes for people can be really negative unless there's some sort of intervention so in my community for example you would see people who um maybe come from physical abuse who may may end end up being perpetrators of violence themselves in their own relationships uh, particularly young men that grow up in toxic masculine households um, you know, that whole domestic violence thing, Jane, the pandemic really showed what a, an epidemic of domestic violence we have in this country and how speaking to the point that we were talking about earlier about women and how women can be kept out of, you know, normal discourse, even through the circumstances of their home life. Because if you're a woman who's grown up or who's living in a domestic violence situation or grown up as a child in a domestic violence situation, that limits your ability to interact with society um, in, in in a normal way. Because you're dealing with the coercive control of maybe the perpetrator of the violence. You might be dealing with the shame of it, even though it's not your shame. Mm. Um, You may be dealing with the anxiety around the stress and the fear. You may be dealing with the physical injuries. Mentally, you may not be doing very well. So domestic violence is so corrosive Mm. to our communities and it is an epidemic. Mm. So yeah, you do see that in areas like this where I live in Artane and other hotspots around the country. But you also the problem with domestic violence, Jane, for me, uh, one of the biggest problems that I would identify is that it's very hidden. Mm. So even in rural settings, people will be living in environments where there is uh, toxic masculinity going on. And I'm not saying for one minute that there isn't domestic violence by females on 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 males or females on their female partners or within um male and male partners or or whatever gender a person may identify to be there is always violence within um any relationship but the issue for me is what that does to the person it takes away their sense of self it takes away their agency it takes away their autonomy to make any decisions and it, it, it removes them from being involved in their community sometimes it removes them from their family their other relationships break down so for children growing up with the ace of domestic violence addiction might be a way that they they use to cope and survive because drugs are the best painkiller so if you're in emotional pain you're going to do something to deal with that if you don't know any other way to do it there could also be a learned behavior because maybe they're maybe their parent who's suffering may use you know, prescription drug or benzos or hash or whatever it is, benzos. Um, In my day, it was Valium. Nowadays, it's Xanax. So they will use all these things to Mm self-medicate. So they, like, we really have to question why there are so many people in the country living in a situation where they feel so helpless that the only way for them to survive is to get out of their head. Mm. That kind of pain and that level of pain is something that we as a society are responsible for Mm. and very often I hear people talk about you know why can't their parents look after them or uh, what it's not the state's job to rear their children and you know I go "Mm, we're looking at fifth generation people from the heroin epidemic of the 70s and the policies that have been made around Uh, funding for schools around housing around mental health services around you know um hospital services all of them policies have created the social construction that we have where we have that triangle Mm. and 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 that's why we as a caring nation need to own up and go we messed up over the last four decades and now it's time for us to put the social construction around these people to provide support so that we're not looking at another four generations or five generations, which is intergenerational poverty, which is intergenerational addiction, intergenerational criminal behavior, domestic violence, all of these things. So that's where we need to be looking at. So definitely in my area, yeah, absolutely. You'll see the impact of ACEs 
um, domestic violence, addiction, depression, mental health, all of them things are there. Yeah, absolutely, Jane. And do you, do you think in terms of young people who might become involved in gang related criminal activity, so they might start dealing drugs at a young age and might use them themselves, that um, there's an element maybe of childhood adversity in their own past? Or, or do you think as well, they might be looking for some kind of safety and belonging with a group of other similar young people um, and then find themselves very quickly in quite dangerous situations maybe. But is there a link between trauma and adversity and, um, and, and uh, young people getting involved in, in criminal networks, do you think, Trina? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think there's a couple of reasons why young people get involved with organised criminal gangs and networks. And I think the Greentown study, your colleague, um, uh, Dr. Sean Redmond, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you were involved in the study, I think you may have been, Jane, but some of the findings of that showed that up to a thousand young people are involved in criminal networks. Brilliant piece of work, brilliant research. From that research, we can see that for the young people that were involved in them criminal networks, particularly the ones at the higher end of the scale, a lot of them, it was just a family business. So that's one reason why young people can get involved. It's the family business. Um, another reason why young people can get involved in drug dealing could be through drugs related intimidation. So they may be in debt bondage to a dealer mm. and they owe money. Um, and they, they feel that they can't tell their parents, their parents may be in addiction or maybe have a mental health problem or whatever, or maybe their parents are just time poor, maybe their parents are both working mm -hmm. and they don't have time to be around for the children because the way mortgages have gone and all that kind of stuff, both parents have to work, so parents are time poor, so that's the poverty of time for the mm -hmm. children. Um, another reason why young people might get involved is, as you say, to feel safer, because if they live in an unsafe um, area it may feel safer to affiliate themselves to the hard shots mm -hmm. to the to the bios so that they're not touched so it may feel safer to be part of a gang and mm -hmm. um, another reason may be coercive control mm -hmm. so they may have found themselves caught in a vulnerable situation maybe online they were groomed maybe they put out some you know video of themselves doing something that they're embarrassed about that could get them into trouble right they've sent incriminating photographs sometimes these organized criminal gangs have been known to use girls to convince younger boys that they're their girlfriend they'll get pictures of them they'll use that as blackmail it is so oh, wow. so corrosive how they and and coercive how they can get involved there's lots of different reasons but aces definitely vulnerabilities of having a, a background with aces in it can definitely make you more vulnerable to organized criminal gangs and they will groom these young people so if you're growing up in an environment where your parental guide, guardian isn't there and um, for whatever reason maybe their addiction or mental health or maybe work and um, these these gangs will very much see you as a easy father and they also, they're very useful because they can get away with caution or they can go to a diversion project or, you know, so there's lots of reasons, Jane, but ACEs definitely factor. And I mean, the evidence will show that there's usually some ACEs there, yeah. Yeah. And um, so I am involved with the, the Greentown pilot projects now and, and domestic violence is one of the things that seems to be common in a lot of the backstories of, of the young people. Um, that you mentioned previously. Do you think as well, because one of the strands of our program is looking at the role of community efficacy. So trying to strengthen local communities so that they believe that they can respond to antisocial behavior and, and drug related crime and that type of thing. Does the community though also have a role to play Trina in terms of improving safety within the home as well as on the streets so that all children can flourish. And I suppose so that elders in the community also needn't feel in terror of the young people. Yeah, and, and, and you know, that's the tricky piece and that's the piece that's going to take time mm -hmm. and that's the piece that's going to take phenomenal relationship building. So all of our structures like on Garda Shia Khan, uh, community projects that provide support around mental health addiction, all that, all of them need to come back and uh, come together in a multi-agency approach and build relationships from the ground up. And the thing about people feeling safe in the home. One of the things that triggers me, <laughs> this triggers me, is when somebody is known within their friend group to be a man who's abusive to his 
wife, for example. And yeah, his friends will sit and have a pint with him. Mm -hmm. That blows my mind. Mm. Because I, as a woman, think, how can you? And if I had a partner who was sitting having a drink with a man who he knew was abusive to his partner and his children, I would find it very difficult to keep that partner in my life. Mm -hmm. Because that's actually what we need to be doing. We need to be pointing out to people, if you know somebody is abusive, they need to become pariahs in our communities. Mm -hmm. Because it almost becomes a contagion mm -hmm. when you've got somebody sitting in a circle. And I remember here in, in the 80s, um, a friend of a boyfriend of mine speaking about some issue he'd had with his girlfriend. And he said, you know, they like gardens. They need a good dig now and again to keep them in order. There was men sitting at a table that didn't even flinch. Some of them laughed. And I remember afterwards saying to my boyfriend, why didn't you say something? Mm. And he was like, oh, Trini, you can't, you can't say something all the time. I go, that's the problem. Mm. That is the problem. When good men like you say nothing. Mm. And that's what we have in communities. And that's where we need to build that relationship from the bottom up. But the community has to feel safe to do that, Jane. I know. And, and if they don't have confidence that on Garda Shia Khan or community response, people who come into work in their area during the day and then leave at five o'clock are not going to be able to support them, then they won't speak up and certainly against drug related um, issues because they have to live there. Mm. And that's where that piece around building that confidence mm. and building that um, relationship of trust. And a lot of the people in these areas feel like social structures have let them down. Mm. So you see this kind of thing and um, this narrative. So when you see recently the um, scandal about 999 calls not being answered, particularly around domestic violence, you can kind of understand how somebody in that situation goes, well, what can I do? I phoned and I got no help. And What's I point. Yeah, yeah. So it's about that's the piece of work that's hard, but I do believe we can do it mm. because there are an awful lot of good people in Angarda Sheikh Khan and I've worked with many of them mm. and they want to work with people and work communities, but they have to be resourced. Mm. And, and we have to look at how community guards work. So when you are a community guard, if you want to get promotion, you need to get promoted out of that area that you're a community guard in. So all of that beautiful work that you've done, building the relationship, you have to let that go if you want a promotion. Mm. The, these kind of systems need to change. Mm. So if you're a beautiful community garden, we know many of them, Jane, build up phenomenal relationships in communities and you're entitled to a promotion or you want a promotion, you should be kept in that area yes. because the value of what, the work you've done at grassroots level will help you as a detective in that area, will help you as a superintendent in that area. But that's the, the way community guards is recognised in, in the Garda Shia concurrent setup, I think really needs to be addressed. Um, mm. So, and, and even people that work in the, in the HSE and the health services and the mental health services, like they need to be able to stay within the areas where they've done a grassroots level. But it's about managing it so that you don't leave people too long either, so mm. that people are not kind of in the same position for 20 years. They need to be in the same area, but with um, different kind of challenges, with different roles but gathering on that relationship building because it's something that I hear very often. Oh, we had this brilliant community garden, then he got promoted. Mm. You know, that's just yeah. an awful shame. <clears throat> on the issue of safety though, and I think it's very interesting that you mentioned that communities have to feel safe in order to kind of come together and collaborate and take action. Um, and, and, in terms of our fight, flight, freeze responses, do you think whole communities or at least pockets of them that let's say have a lot of drug related intimidation and gang uh, activity might kind of be in a sort of collapsed or almost shutdown state that they're just really um, trying to, to, to block their eyes and ears to what's going on around them in order to keep themselves safe? Yeah, let's call it what it is. They're traumatised. Yeah. They're traumatised communities. And, and like the inner city of Dublin, when the Kin and Hutch feud was happening, um, actually what the people did, did there was they fought. Right. They said, enough's enough. And they stood up. And what we did was collectively, we got a massive meeting going. There was probably 500 people at the meeting. 
we created a coalition between community partners, residents, businesses. Then we spoke to the government. We got the government, uh, we got TDs involved, Mary Lou MacDonald, Pascal, uh, Gary Gannon, uh, all of them. And Mary Lou was the conduit to the government for her. She was brilliant at creating them connections. And the Kenny came down. Uh, Catherine Sapone was there. She was the Children's Commission at the time. So we we spoke to them all and they brought Kieran Mulvey and they did a process and they now have a task force there. So the community feels emboldened. The community feel empowered. Mm -hmm. And like it took time, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's four or five years now. But up till that point, they were what you're talking about and they were shut down mm -hmm. and they were walking out of their blocks and they were seeing drug dealing and they were putting their head down and going to work because most of the people who live in the area that I'm speaking about, the northeast inner city, are not criminals. And um, mm -hmm. a lot of these people that are dealing are coming from different areas. It's very, very strategic the way it's done. Um, same in all of our bond, bond flats, the same thing's going on there. Like, so the, even in Ballymun, the same thing's going on there. The criminality is usually just a small minority uh, of, of the community and other people coming in. So for people, for them to feel safe, the only way for them to do was block it out and ignore it because it was too dangerous. But I think once the shooting started in the inner city and people realized, like I was walking in the area at the time and I was fearful that I would be in the wrong place at the wrong time in, in our capital city. Like my mother, my family were like, you know, when you're going to meetings in Altrina, you are taking your car around you. And I go, yeah, I'd be walking through the inner city. You know what I mean? Like, um, but, but like when that kind of thing happened, the inner city people said, you know what, enough's enough and stood up. Yeah, let's fight this. Yeah, but they had the support of the government. They yeah. had the support of the guards. They worked with the guards. We still have the committees there where you've got residents on committees with guards. You've got community youth workers on committees with guards. You've got this, you know, dialogue going on. You've got a, a transfer of information, not in a rat way. You've got a transfer of information about where there might be something where there's an issue that we can resolve it before it becomes a, a, a huge issue. This kind of thing going on and there's trust in the guards. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's where I think we need to be heading in all of these pockets. We need to be creating, using the pilot programme of the NEIC task force and then, you know, adapting and amending it to the nuance of whatever community it is that we're, we're like, if the community is in another part of, of Dublin, well then go in there, talk, talk to community reps, find out about community culture, find out what's important and then build the structures around that. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to be doing, absolutely. Can I ask you about um, reflections about young people's experience of school? So um, many youngsters who get involved in any kind of crime, but gang related crime as well, tend to drop out of school early. Have you heard young people uh, say things about school and their relationships with teachers? And, you know, did they feel safe, secure and loved in, in the school? Um, well, I suppose I, I was a community training centre manager. So that's like a second chance education for young people who have been referred from the courts or who have been um, excluded from school. So, yeah, I would have heard a lot of young people talk about school and saying it just didn't suit me. Um, some people with diagnosis of ADHD or borderline personality, all these different are autism on the spectrum, all these different diagnosis disorders. And actually, sometimes I would listen. Now, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I can't say, but I would often think, actually, why are they not diagnosing these people with what it is? They've got trauma. You know, right. They've got a trauma response. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what we need to do. And actually, the principal in Ballymun is pretty phenomenal. Uh, Fran is her name. And she's very forward thinking and she does a lot of stuff around aces and when i was working in ballymun i had quite a few meetings with her about it and she's she has a a kind of an approach to trauma and form so if a young person is acting now they will take them from the from the classroom and, and bring them to a quiet area where they can talk through why their response was what it was not to isolate them yeah. but to give them breathing space because they're overwhelmed by what's going on um Oh, there's lots of things that can be done. Like, you know, you can look at short and timetables for people. You can look at um, listening to young people. So if a young person says, Trina triggers me, I, I can't stand her. She triggers me. Well, take them out of Trina's class. Yeah. You know, 
don't keep triggering young people like listen but but not just listen act on what we hear mm -hmm. and that's not to say that we just pander to every will of young people I mean young people will push us and, and try and get their own way and all that kind of stuff but actually if they're really traumatized by something well then we need to hear what they're saying and we need to resolve that for them mm -hmm. so um school as a piece for some of the young people I worked with just didn't work but second chance education like you reach worked um, C CTETB, the Education and Training Board, all them different projects, they work because for some pe young people, academia is just not there for them. Mm -hmm. They may be coming from fourth or fifth generation people that left school early, so they don't have the support at home. So mm -hmm. if they want to do a mathematical problem or they want to do something to do with, you know, geography or history, they don't have anybody at home to help them. Mm -hmm. So they're, 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 they're disadvantaged in that way as well. So they don't have the resources at home. They, they may not have the money to buy the books. Like yeah. it's far too complex to just say it's young people just dropping out of school. Mm -hmm. There's so many reasons why young people don't actively participate in school and relationships can feel very persecutory to them, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I remember one young lad said to me, so let's say the teacher's name was Jane. Oh, Jane hated me. She couldn't wait until she got me out of school. And it was like a personality clash between this young lad and Jane. And I said, did you ever ask to be moved out of, out of Jane's class? It was a male teacher, actually. And um, he said, like, the, the principal just wouldn't move me. So I, I left. Like, the young lad said, I respectfully asked to be moved mm -hmm. out of this teacher's class. And they didn't. So he left school. He ended up involved in selling hash. Then he ended up getting a caution, ended up being referred to me. He's now working for Google. He's now Lovely. working for Google, this kid. He's brilliant. You know, so so with the right interventions, you can really you can really help young people. But it's about listening to them when they're telling you something's wrong. Don't just put it off as young people just throwing tantrums because very often they're not. Yeah, well, there's a nice phrase um, that I, I've heard time and again in trauma trainings that all behavior is communication. Mm. So if a young boy is acting out or gets aggressive over something, well, the likelihood is that whoever we are, if we're their teacher, we have made them feel unsafe somehow or frightened them or angered them. Yeah. And we we don't look at our role in that. And it can be a very small role or it can be a massive role. Like if we humiliate someone in public, yeah. um, no one likes that. Do any of us like that? But if, if I'm a 12 or 13 year old boy with no ability to um, regulate my emotions, I might explode and then get kicked out. Um, and, and as you say, you know, that can be the beginning of the end then of the school system. Um, one one uh, interviewee recently said to me that he asked a young boy why he wasn't at school. And the boy said, because the teacher told me I was thick and would never amount to anything, which I found pretty shocking in this day and age. Oh, no. no. I'm not shocked. Not? Yeah. I'm not shocked. I've, I've heard some terrible stuff. Like... Like you say, when somebody explodes, and I've said this before, you know, we need to stop asking what's wrong with him. We need to start asking what happened to him mm -hmm. and then really listening mm -hmm. and acting on what we hear because mm -hmm. it's a process. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just enough for young people to be able to vent. Mm -hmm. We need to provide uh, some sort of resolution to that trauma for them. And, and yeah. That's it, you know, and, and all it takes is one good adult, you know, and on the on the opposite side, all it takes is one bad adult. Yes. Or, or one highly stressed, impatient, angry adult at a particular time as well, yeah. because I don't think teachers or any of us always understand the impact that our behavior and our responses can have at someone who's going through too much already. Yeah. Um, and that can be the, the final straw then. Um, but do you think as well that there can be a reluctance, say, on the part of teachers or frontline people to go anywhere near trauma because what it might mean for them in terms of reporting or intervening? Uh, and I ask this because um, an acquaintance of mine who's a teacher before told me she was instructed by colleagues not to ask kids any more about their weekends in case they might say something that divulged I guess some trauma or inappropriate kind of carry on in the household that they would then have to report yeah to yeah like Jane I'm sure you remember when we were in school we used to do my news on a Monday yeah. do you remember yeah. and we used to do my news on a Monday about our weekend and then on a Friday we do my news about the week mm. you don't hear about that anymore 
unless you're working in a school where there's special needs assistance and special needs assistants are so qualified to deal with this that they're very happy to have them conversations because they're trained our teachers are overwhelmed mm. in the classroom and i'm not i'm not you know uh, justifying what you're speaking to there but i'm just in practical terms teachers are overwhelmed mm. and the fact that special needs assistance schools are calling out for them they've identified maybe 20 students need them and they might only get funding for five students mm. who makes that decision mm. you know yeah. and, and then who makes the decision that maybe a private school that's got lots of fee paying members gets funding for something when a desh school only gets five special needs assistants when they've identified 20. So when you talk about teachers not listening to young people in this way because for fear they'd have to deal with the issues, I sometimes feel the government won't listen to us because they they don't listen to what we're saying because they only give us maybe a quarter of what we're asking for because surely we're over exaggerating and it's almost like this you know paternal kind of relationship going on between the government and people who work on the ground and between teachers and, and working with children and if teachers don't feel that they have the resources to support people if they hear something like teachers should have a phone number to ring if there's a mental health problem a phone number to ring if there's addiction a phone number to ring if there's domestic violence this is basic stuff but it's just not there the resources are not there to support teachers so as a teacher i can kind of understand Mm -hmm. why they don't ask them questions mm -hmm. uh, because what can they do with that information if they're not trained to deal with it number one and if they don't have the resources around them because some people would feel you're better off not poking the bear yeah well i've heard it a lot uh, in talks i've given about aces and trauma in the past even from say social workers or um other kind of caring professionals it's kind of like oh, I don't really want to go opening the can of worms because I'm not qualified. Yes. But what, what they're missing is, I suppose, the therapeutic um, nature of just being listened to. You've mentioned it several times in yeah. the interview, just listening to a young person or a struggling mom or any of us when we're yeah. highly stressed and yeah. overwhelmed. There is a, an energetic release that can come yeah. from being validated, isn't there? You don't have to be a psychiatrist because mm -hmm. most of them aren't trauma informed anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or many of them are not, you know, not everyone needs medication either or to be yeah. pathologized, you know. And and you see, that's the thing when, when you pathologize people, then it's just, you know, put them in a corner and, you know, yeah. dull, dull their emotions, you know. Um, although it's important for some people, obviously. To of be course it is. Of course. But I think I think what you're saying there is the piece that I hear a lot. I'm not qualified. Mm. You know, you don't have to be qualified to be a listening ear. And that's where when people are aces aware, mm -hmm. when they understand that the practice needs to be trauma informed, all they need to do is listen. Mm. But then where is the support for that professional? And that's so true. Where is the support for a guard? who might go from a domestic violence situation to a suicide, to a shooting, to a, a, a house burglary. Where is support for them when you've got peer support? Which are who's supporting each other? Where is the support for a teacher who's dealing with a very traumatized child who's, who's disrupting a class and they listen to them and then the rest of the class feels that their time is being taken up by listening to them. like so it's all about support so yeah. who supports the carers so yeah. for people to be trauma informed they need to understand that listening actually is the best thing you can do to anybody who's trauma uh, who's traumatized yeah. or anyone who's triggered is yeah. listening to them just be quiet yeah. just be quiet let the person come in through the situation spiral themselves down once to regulate how they feel by shouting back at somebody who's shouting nobody's ever going to be heard mm. but actually most people's first response if they're not trauma informed is to shout at somebody shouting at them mm. yeah yeah where actually if you lower your voice the person who's shouting will bring their voice down because they want to hear what you're saying mm. so as a de-escalation -es technique like even when my poor dad was sick and when he was dying and he was very very ill and i went into the room one day and there's all these people shouting at him and he's dying mm. i said stop shouting at him and i whispered in his ear and he calmed down mm. we're like that looking at me mm. and, and th that's what's important about de-escalation techniques and about knowing how important it is to listen to people mm. even in their most traumatized mm. state 
they will not listen to somebody who's been toxic towards them. They will not take on more toxic stress. They can't. They nope. need time, space and patience to be able to regulate how they feel or or to um, explode if that's what they need to do. That's that's a regulation for people. So, yeah, that that listening piece is important. But people are terrified that they're going to be held responsible for something. Yeah. And also, Trina, it can be uncomfortable to listen, you know, depending what young people will say. I know I've heard things over the years and your, my own ears have started pounding. I've started to sweat because it's stressful. Um, but can we then imagine what it might be like to yeah. be carrying around those secrets yeah. with no one to tell because none of us are willing yeah. To, yeah. to put ourselves in that position? But as you say, we cannot talk about trauma-informed and responsive practice without minding the people who are then doing the listening and the um the compassionate kindness because yeah. they are likely to absorb the trauma themselves they might already have some of their own and yeah. so secondary and vicarious trauma are are probably rife in professions like the guards or the prison service Absolutely. you know or Absolutely. social work um so so they need minding too um i've taken a heap of your time but i've just uh one or, a pleasure. one or two more and and you mentioned your event um that you're you're organizing and how you'll have some folks with lived experience talking including that chap the rugby player um i'm a big believer in in harnessing the knowledge and insights and um you know the skills the unique skills as well of experts by experience do you think we do this enough in ireland or do we do it in a way that's really, truly meaningful, Trina? I think we're getting better, Jane. I think, I think the community sector, so because I'm 100 years old, I remember the <laughs> community sector wasn't a professional. Yeah. Okay, so it was all just grassroots volunteers. So towards the mid to late 80s, we started looking at the community sector being professionalized. So you could now get qualifications in youth work, in community development, all the kind of social kind of, uh, kind of social sciences, you know? Um, but there were much more um, nuance to do with community cultures and that mm. kind of thing. So that meant that people could get qualifications, people could uh, read deeper research, people could look at applying uh, theoretical models to community so in in the since the 90s i suppose we found that and um, because people can apply academia to these roles we're getting better at having people that are both practitioners and academics and um, that's definitely happened because you learn by practice so you, like i could speak to somebody who's gone to college straight out of school who's done a master's degree who's done a phd and i could put them in the middle of say ballymun and um they could have a brilliant phd they'd be eaten up and chewed out in a matter of seconds like even somebody with my experience i have gone into communities and they have eaten me up and chewed me out even recently because right. Because that's what happens. Communities have their own culture. Yeah. They know what they want. They know what they need. And if you come in, you know. You're an outsider. Yeah. And you start blabbing about what you think is the right thing to do. You'd be very quickly told. And, and, and that has happened to me on a number of occasions. <laughs> I've been eaten without salt. Um, and that's, and that's, the, that's the challenge, isn't it? That's how we build relationships. So it's about creating a situation where you can have a common association with somebody, where you can... Um, talk about uh, facets of life that have affected you and affected your community that you're walking in and, and draw the parallel between and marry your experience with their experience and that kind of stuff. So I definitely think it, it is getting better, um, Jane, without doubt. Um, I mean, everything is a work in progress, isn't it? And mm -hmm. when you think about it, it was really, I mean, I think community development in Minute was like late 80s, early 90s. So it's only 40 odd years ago. So we've had a huge kind of a uh, journey, a transition that we went on in that 40 years, mm -hmm. which is not a long time really no. when you look at it. Um, so I definitely think we're on, we're on the way up with uh, recognizing the importance of lived experience. But I do think that we do have some very disempowered people who have lived experiences mm -hmm. who we can't access. Yeah. 
yeah. um, because of the circumstances that they live in. So maybe people from the traveling community, maybe people in the direct provision. Oh, Jesus. I mean, it's just appalling. Mm. And people in homeless services who uh, on a daily basis can barely muster the energy to survive, never mind put the, their story forward. And usually it's only when people have recovered from the situation that they're in that they can then start telling their lived experience and story in a historical context. Yeah. So, because when people are in it, they, 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 they simply can't, Jane, because they're just surviving. Yeah, and it's, it's inappropriate as well to be thrusting them into any kind of limelight to tell their story. It's maybe not safe. But also, I suppose, the danger then of maybe becoming a, a permanent lived experience um, storyteller is, is that you get stuck in that as well, or, or you might be reliving it all the time. Um, and yet, from my experience, there's nothing more kind of powerful for giving true insights into, let's say, recovery from addiction or um, the impact of participating in a violence reduction unit and and. Yeah. learning how to navigate a life out of violence and crime and and it's always relational is what I find always. You know, people people can never do it without other people loving them and seeing them in a new yeah. way yeah um, and that's it actually I, I had a conversation with the two Norries you know uh, James and Timmy yeah and they were talking about when they presented themselves back to their community without drugs mm -hmm. without the crutch of being a hard man without the crutch of alcohol and so presenting back into the community and they I asked them I was doing a podcast so I wasn't supposed to be asking questions but I asked them what was <laughs> for them you know me and both of them was about relationships yeah it was about you know Timmy's wife I mean she sounds magic woman oh wonderful and James's relationships with his family and actually the guards and um, their stories are phenomenal and I also um, met a really interesting guy I Patrick mcdonald uh mcdonough i think his name and he lived in boston and he lived on the same balcony as whitey bulger oh, in right. boston. and two of his siblings were killed through the whitey bulger gang so i mean for people that know whitey bulger his his brother was the mayor of boston mm -hmm. and he was the biggest criminal uh gangster dr drug dealing um but this guy, Patrick Mac Michael McDonough, came over and did a piece for me. Um, at a, I, was, I was involved with YPAR in the inner city, the Young People at Risk Protocols. And we produced a piece of research through the University of Limerick, actually, um, called Reach Out, um, which is about working with young people and how we can reach them and get them to reach out within the community. Great piece of work. Um, by the academics there. And Michael, uh, Michael Patrick McDonough is his name. That's his full name. He speaks about the transformation of trauma to recovery. And he speaks about how using, he, he just spoke on word pieces um, and they're his lived experiences. Wow. Honestly, look him up, Jane, this guy is yeah. phenomenal. And um, Michael Patrick McDonough, he's written a few books as well. Um, but his spoken word pieces, like we had a, a, a launch of that piece of research. I'm going to say there was 300 people there. Um, he, you could hear a pin drop mm -hmm. when speaking. It was, and everybody could feel mm -hmm. what he was voicing through his trauma. Um, so yeah, people like that, I think are important, but, but there is that piece, and this is again, the piece that we have to navigate carefully, that we don't make the trauma define that person. Yes. And that's the piece for individuals to do. I can't do that for somebody else. Like my childhood traumas don't define me. Yes. They, they definitely have informed where I've gone in life. Mm. But if you are to hold on to your trauma throughout your whole life, you'd be banjaxed. Mm. You'd be absolutely exhausted carrying it around. Mm. So it's about resolving it and taking the learning from it mm. and then not letting your past define your future. Mm. Uh, that sounds all very uh, kind of mindfulness and, you know, very wishy-washy, but that actually is the reality. Do not let your past define your future, mm. but it needs to inform who you are into your future. Yeah. And that's the piece, I think, for people who used our lived experience to give back. They need to navigate. Yeah, there was a beautiful article that I referenced a lot in my own PhD by a chap called 
um, Sean Ginwright about healing centered engagement and he's um, a professional with young people an African American man working mainly with uh, young African Americans in um, California I think and he says you know um, trauma informed isn't even good enough really because there is still a bit of a deficit focus you know where it's all about the trauma whereas we do need to look at about what's strong with the person what's right with them and their culture and draw on whatever strengths um, that they have or have around them in order to have the, the best prospects of flourishing. Do you think that's important, Trina, yourself? Yeah, and actually the Northside Partnership very much do a lot of work around that. You're probably aware of that. So they do all that kind of positive mental kind of, you know, finding people's positive uh, capacities, mm -hmm. the resilience, all of these things. And then they build kind of resources around what they find are the positive things that that person can work mm -hmm. from rather than the, the trauma deficit, as you say. So you're yeah, absolutely focusing on the positive, but acknowledging yes acknowledging and building from and resolving and that's what that's what resolving trauma is about mm -hmm. it's about replacing new experiences in a positive way mm -hmm. rather than holding on to the negative so absolutely that whole positivity piece positive mental attitude all of that is so important and um, it's like everything i suppose jane um everything i've worked on i i'd be very much about everything in middle ground yeah. nothing nothing should be one or the other everything yeah. should be gray um like it shouldn't just be one response it should be a response that's appropriate at the time and a, and able to change depending on the circumstances mm -hmm. and that and that for me is how i live my life in a very and um, now some people might say i'm a bit airy fairy and all that but i'm i'm very you know i'm very underground i know exactly you know what's acceptable to me and what a boundary is yeah but sometimes boundaries change and, and yeah. we have to be open to that mm -hmm. um and, 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 and that's what it's about. The, the creative process of, of navigating your way through life is about not being stuck. And I think stuckness yes. is something that people dealing with trauma can find themselves in. Mm -hmm. And when you're in stuckness, you can't move on. You're not resolving anything. You yeah. may be using your trauma as something that defines you and gives you voice mm -hmm. and gives you position within a community group or whatever it is. But if you stay stuck in that, then you're not resolving really. So um, stuckness is something that uh, definitely when you're dealing with trauma and certainly in my 20s, I was in a period of stuckness mm -hmm. because of my own personal traumas. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's an age when you're kind of getting to know yourself and all that. Kind of, and I remember being in that stuckness going, what am I doing? Where am I going? And these big, you know, existential questions that you ask yourself, why am I here? And all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and, and that's for people a space that they need to be given mm -hmm. to go positive and have a positive mental attitude to acknowledge the trauma of the past to acknowledge how it's informed you and then to you define your future with supports yeah with supports last question then trina and thank you so much for for sharing okay. so much of your time and your your wonderful work with me in terms of government policy how can we place more emphasis on promoting safe, healthy relationships? Well, I think, I think that we, like, there are so many people in government that are listening. Um, I think the way our policies work around funding is just a huge issue. Um, and, and I'll outline that a bit more and explain it a bit more. So if you've got a U club, for example, who have four youth workers and every year in October they're told and put on notice until the funding is agreed in mm -hmm. December that they may not have a job in January. You're creating a destabilizing to their ability to do their job because everybody has a mortgage to pay or rent to pay or whatever it is. So in order to get the best people working in these resources, we need to commit to multi-annual funding. I agree. Yeah. It's not acceptable to me anymore. And I've written this on paper after paper. And um, very often then papers are not published and put in the bin because they don't want to hear it. But that's fine. I'll keep writing them. We need to commit to multi-annual funding because funding community resources should not be on, on a 12-month rolling basis. Because as I said, in October, the, the annual plans have to be written. The budget submitting has, has to be written. So for two months every year, people don't know if they're going to get a job. So how can people plan? 
Mm. So that's one way that I think we need to be looking at um, supporting community responses mm. to trauma and some of the, you know, social issues that we have in communities in nationwide. One of the other things we need to be doing is we need to be looking at our institutions that in some ways are archaic. So institutions that are maybe 80, 90 years old, you know, things have moved on, things have changed, how we do things, how we do promotion, how we train people. Um, even when you look at the guards, the training that they get, while it's a wonderful degree, they don't have any training in ACES. Um, you may get some superintendents who are really interested. Guards have to be ACES aware. It's just unfathomable to me that they're not at this stage. I just don't. Um, but yet there are an awful lot of younger guards who are ACES aware, yeah. who are doing their research. Um, I think we need to look at the training that guards get in, in um, how they deal with communities, HSE, mental health services. And going back to your point of um, in schools where teachers say they're afraid to touch that, they're afraid to poke the bear. Well, we need to have, you know, educators, whatever, whether it's a community educator or whether it's a school um, or whether it's a, a, a second chance education, everybody needs to be ace aware and trauma informed. We need people in A&Es to be trauma informed so that they know if a young person comes in with obvious signs of a violent struggle, they can ring a youth work navigator to come in to work with that young person when they're at their most vulnerable point, mm -hmm. when they've been injured through a violent incident, that they could be reached you know, that's what we need. We need everybody to know about ACEs and be trauma informed. That's 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 what I think anyway. And it's doable. It is. Yeah. Trina O'Connor, you're you're a revelation. Um, <laughs> I've so enjoyed talking to you and, and thank you very much for all the wonderful work you do and your energy and um your enthusiasm and your uh relentlessness. It's so important. <laughs> I'm certainly relentless, Jane. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Thanks. Thank for you. So this was Law and Justice and the series is Relationship Matters. I'm Jane Mulcahy and my guest was the wonderful Trina O'Connor. Thanks a million, Trina. Thank you.